We should be leaving them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning, not just after we got through with it. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 2584 falls far short of our responsibilities to present and future generations, and so I obviously oppose the bill, and I'll reserve the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Idaho will suspend. The committee will rise informally. The House will be in order. The chair will receive a message. Mr. Speaker, a message from the President. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Secretary. I'm directed by the President of the United States to deliver to the House of Representatives a message in writing. The committee will resume its sitting. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield five minutes to the esteemed chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for five minutes. Thank the chairman for yielding. I, I rise today to commend this bill to our colleagues and uh, urge that it be passed. It includes $27.5 billion in federal spending. That's a reduction of $2.1 billion uh, below last year, $3.8 billion below the President's request. Some have complained that these cuts are too much, too fast. But it's important to remember that these agencies and programs have seen unprecedented massive increases in spending in recent years. This sort of excess has contributed to our astronomical debt and is threatening our recovery. We simply can't fund unnecessary and ineffective programs when we are borrowing 42 cents on every dollar we spend. We just simply can't afford it. This legislation makes smart, significant cuts across each and every agency funded by this bill. The bill still adequately funds the agencies that are important to the health of our citizens, the stability of our economy, and the preservation of our environment. But we've made some priority adjustments in areas that can and should withstand lower budgets. Some areas that will see bigger reductions include climate change programs, which has trimmed 22 percent from last year, and land acquisition funding, which is at a level nearly 79 percent lower than last year. Frankly, many of the cuts in this bill are just plain common sense, particularly when it comes to the Environmental Protection Agency. The reductions and provisions in this bill were made with very good reason to rein in unparalleled out-of-control spending and job-killing over-regulation by the EPA. Though we all appreciate the core mission of the EPA, this agency has lost grips with economic reality and has become the epitome of the continued and damaging regulatory overreach of this administration. We can't allow an agency to circumvent the authority of Congress, especially when it has such destructive effects on our nation's economic recovery. I'd like to uh, say that we've heard from Americans uh, all across the country and across every sector of the economy who attribute harsh regulatory burdens to their economic uncertainty, uncertainty that's crushing job growth. It's my hope in, that this legislation sends the message loud and clear. Legislation by regulation must stop. We've restricted funding for EPA personnel, as well as addressed EPA's flawed greenhouse gas regulations and de facto moratorium on mining permits in Appalachia. It's my hope that provisions like these will return the EPA to a better working order, facilitating a more effective government, sending money where it really needs to go, and removing burdensome barriers to job creation to clear the way for economic recovery. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank uh, Chairman Simpson and uh, Ranking Member Moran uh, the subcommittee and all of the staff for all their hard work on this very tough bill. 
Chairman Simpson has led the way on an excellent bill. Uh, I think that makes good on our promise to reduce government spending with real significant spending reforms. His subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, held 22 oversight hearings, more than any other of the 12 subcommittees on appropriations. I'm confident that they've gone above and beyond uh, their duty to ensure that these cuts come from wasteful and redundant programs. I know these decisions were not made lightly, were not made easy, but they are responsible and will help us move in the right direction. Although it's been difficult at times, the House uh, should be proud to be moving uh, this year's appropriations process in regular order, the first time in years. With this bill, we will have finished more than half of the 12, uh, fiscal 12 appropriation bills before the recess, and nearly all of the bills have been moved through subcommittee or full committee, therefore are in, on cue to come to the full body. This return to regular order has contributed to thoughtful, collaborative appropriations bills that reflect the will of the American people, and it will help get our nation's finances in order. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky yields back. The gentleman from Idaho reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield four minutes to the very distinguished ranking member of the full appropriations committee, Mr. Dix. The gentleman is recognized for four minutes. I ask unanimous consent to, reside, re to revise and extend <coughs> my remarks. Without objection. <coughs> I rise to state my opposition to H.R. 2584, the FY12 Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill. But before I state the reasons for my strong opposition, I want to again recognize Chairman Simpson, Ranking Member Moran, and their staff for all the hard work that was necessary to put together the FY12 Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill. I also want to repeat my gratitude to the majority for being inclusive when developing this bill. That being said, however, the low allocation foisted on the Interior Subcommittee made it po impossible to develop a bill that is responsible and reasonable. So it is no surprise that the resulting bill will harm the environment and our ongoing efforts to preserve America's natural heritage. Two key examples of this potential damage are that the bill includes the lowest level of spending in the Land and Water Conservation Fund in more than 40 years and funding levels for EPA not seen in more than a decade. Overall, the allocation for the bill is 7 percent below the amount enacted in the current year, a level that will have a negative impact on our natural resource agencies and on the Environmental Protection Agency. After the EPA took a substantial cut of 16 percent in the current fiscal year, 2011, the Republican majority is now proposing a further reduction in the agency's budget of 18 percent. You add that together, it's a 34 percent reduction in just this year. This bill would substantially diminish the capacity of EPA to carry out its responsibilities, which may actually be the goal of some of my colleagues on the other side. But the repercussions will be felt across the nation including an ever-growing backlog of water treatment infrastructure projects and a decline in air and water quality. As was pointed out in a recent Washington Post article, the vast majority of the EPA's funds pass through to states and localities that are already squeezed by budget cuts. These infra infrastructure projects create jobs in communities all across the country and provide one of the most basic services taxpayers expect, clean water. The Bush administration's EPA administrator estimated that there was a $688 billion nationwide backlog of clean water infrastructure projects, and that total is even larger today. That backlog will not disappear if we just ignore it. But as we have seen in so many cases this year, the majority has decided to push this problem further down the road. In addition to the clearly insufficient levels of funding across the board in, the, in this legislation, we were surprised that the majority also included a wish list of special interest writers to the bill that will hand off, handcuff the EPA and the Department of the Interior. 
Uh, these types of writers are largely ideological, have no impact on deficit reduction, and will be rejected by the Senate and the President, hopefully. It seems that special interest writers have become the new earmarks. This bill will, and I support earmarks, this bill will make, was made even worse when the majority adopted more special interest writers with amendments that were approved at full committee. And I fear that there will be more policy uh, amendments offered on the floor as we consider this bill. One of the writers is language that would effectively block any funding to the Fish and Wildlife Service for new listings under the Endangered Species Act. As Mr. Moran said, there are 260 candidate species waiting to be listed and they will uh, not receive the protection of the uh, Endangered Species Act. Here is the situation that Fish and Wildlife Service... To, yeah. uh, I yield an additional minute to Mr. Dixon. Yeah. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. And, uh, uh, speaking of that 260, of that total, there are just under 30 species that are poised for listing in the near future. The spending provisions in this bill would block further activity to protect these declining species. And remember, if you delay listing too long, a species will go extinct, thus making recovery impossible. I also will be strongly supporting the amendments to, uh, that aim to remove these riders. These amendments include an attempt to protect Grand Canyon National Park and the folks who depend on the Colorado River for drinking water and the potential danger from new uranium mines. Another statement that I strongly support, amendment that I strongly support, will increase funding for sanitation fi facilities for Native American communities. In closing, I do want to reiterate my praise expressed at subcommittee mark by, for Mr. Simpson, Mr. Moran, Mr. Cole, and other subcommittee members for the funding levels for programs serving American Indians. It is gratifying that the subcommittee bipartisan commitment to tribal programs forged over the last few years has been continued by the new majority. It has expired. The gentleman from Virginia reserves. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield to the gentleman from Washington. Uh, such time as may consume for the purposes of colloquy. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, chairman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, as you know, two months ago, the Secretary of the Interior announced that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service would remove gray wolves from the Endangered Species Act list in areas covering the northern Rocky Mountain states and roughly the easternmost one-third of the state of Washington, the eastern quarter of the state of Oregon, and a small piece of Utah. I understand that H.R. 2584 also would exempt from judicial review any final rule issued by the Secretary that delists wolves in the state of Wyoming and the great, uh, western Great Lakes. So I commend the Chairman for your leadership uh, to see that these states are given a chance to succeed in their management of species. As with other decisions, the Secretary of the Interior's May announcement does not resolve the problem for many agriculture areas in states that don't fit neatly within the Fish and Wildlife Service, Service's arbitrarily set geographic boundaries. And it reverses a policy that the Fish and Wildlife Service itself implemented by regulation in 2003, in which rules, wolves were delisted in all of the state of Washington and other areas with appropriate state recovery measures in place. Under the current administration's policy in my own district in central Washington, wolves will be delisted on an eastern side uh, up to a highway that cuts through a heavy agriculture area. Wolves on one side of the highway will be listed, on the other side not. The same is true in Oregon and Utah. I appreciate the steps the gentleman has included in this bill to create a more rational approach towards delisting these recovered wolves by allowing the states to manage the populations using sound wildlife management principles. I want to confirm my understanding that the bill and accompanying report language on page 10 is intended to include in states, in all states in their entirety within the northern Rocky uh, Mountain area, including Washington, Oregon, and Utah. I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Yes, our intent is to make it clear that states with approved management plans should be given authority to manage delisted wolf populations in their states. The language in the bill ensures that 
The listing decisions are made by scientists on the ground, not judges in the courtrooms. Report language clarifies that similar bill language should apply to areas where wolves have expanded beyond their original population boundaries once state management plans are in place and the Fish and Wildlife Service determines that the population should be delisted. That language is intended to address states that currently face mixed management challenges like Washington, Oregon, and Utah. I know you're concerned about this issue and Representative Walden from Oregon has shared with me similar concerns as well. Uh, reclaiming my time, I thank the gentleman for that clarification. As we both know, the problem goes far beyond wolves. The ESA has nearly 1,400 listed species in the U.S. and hundreds of millions of dollars being spent by local, state, federal, and private entities on ESA activities. Yet, federal agencies are being regularly sued for poor science and poorly drafted regulations, and only 20 species have been recovered. Do you agree with me that the Endangered Species Act is broken and needs to be modernized and updated? And I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yes, today's ESA is so highly contagious, uh, contagious, political and litigious that it has become a failure of public policy. Funding authorizations for ESA programs expired nearly two decades ago. But because we, we have continued to fund them, ESA reform continues to stay on the back burner. This bill calls for a timeout for unauthorized funding for new critical habitat and ESA listing decisions in order to encourage authorizers and stakeholders to come to the table to bring the ESA into the 21st century, which it is not now. Well, reclaiming my time, a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Salazar acknowledged, and I quote, there are changes and improvements that can be made to how we deal with endangered species, end quote, and that, and I quote again, we need to have an endangered species program that does, in fact, work, end quote. I couldn't agree more with the Secretary's statement. The Natural Resources Committee that I chair has jurisdiction over ESA as well as uh, NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service and we will be working in coming months to conduct robust oversight and look at much needed proposals to update this law. I appreciate your leadership and look forward to working with you on this very important uh, issue and I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman. It is important that authorizing committees like yours be able to modernize landmark laws like the ESA laws that were widely supported when they were passed but no longer work as Congress originally intended. No less than 56 agencies or programs in this bill have expired authorizations and stakeholders and interested members of Congress should know that these programs are also at risk of defunding if they are not reauthorized. Our bill hopefully will provide incentive for stakeholders who have been unwilling to participate in the reform process to finally entertain serious reform of the ESA, which I am sure your committee will actively pursue. We claim it my time and that certainly is the intent that, uh, that we tend to pursue and I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. I yield back to the gentleman. Reserve the balance of my time. Well, the gentleman Gen yields. The gentleman from Idaho reserves. The gentleman from Virginia has the time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, minority would respectfully request of the majority that such colloquies, including the ones that just transpired as well as future ones, be shared with the minority. Uh, that they are meant to be a clarification of language and funding in the bill, and uh, they may very well prompt uh, actions on our part to, uh, to strike language if we don't fully understand what the intent was and that may very well apply to the delisting of wolves. So we would appreciate when, we have, uh, when the majority engages in colloquies sharing that language uh, with the minority. Would the gentleman like to respond? I would yield to the gentleman. Uh, just takes I up three. For yielding. I, don't, I got no problem with, with sharing with you the colloquies that we engage in. Good. Uh, so we would like a, uh, a copy of the colloquy that just uh, transpired. A and um, at this point, I would uh, yield five minutes to the, uh, uh, the, the gentleman from New York, uh, the uh, ranking member of the uh, Financial Services Appropriations Subcommittee, Mr. Serrano. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes without objection. I thank the gentleman. I rise today to express my opposition to H.R. 2584, the Interior Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2012. First, however, I would like to acknowledge both Chairman Simpson and Congressman Moran, who have worked in a bipartisan and collaborative way throughout the lengthy hearing and markup process. It has been a pleasure for me to serve as a member of this subcommittee. Unfortunately, this subcommittee's insufficient spending allocation has resulted in deep cuts in funding for important agencies and programs. In addition, numerous anti-environmental writers have been attached to this legislation. 
Although there are many to choose from, I would like to mention a few of these cutbacks and what their impact will be on specific agencies and programs. For example, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is crucial in helping to fund land acquisition and in protecting threatened and endangered species, was funded at $66 million, which is $834 million below the budget request. State and tribal wildlife grants, which play an important role in making sure that we have strategic and effective wildlife conservation programs, were funded at $22 million, or $73 million below request. The Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, is funded at $7.1 billion, which is $1.8 billion below the request. At this funding level, the EPA will be prevented from accomplishing many of its missions to protect our environment. There are so many destructive riders attached to this legislation that it is difficult to figure out which ones to highlight during my brief remarks. One that specifically harms my state of New York was added during full committee markup. This rider prevents the Great Lakes states from receiving any EPA funding if they have implemented ballast water rules that have stronger timelines on standards than the federal or international requirements that are currently in effect. Because New York has been at the forefront of efforts to require ships to treat their ballast water before discharging it into New York's waterways, our state will be immediately affected. States should have the right to protect their own waters from dangerous aquatic invasive species. Another particularly harmful rider would stop the EPA from limiting greenhouse gas emissions from a stationary sources for, one year, for a one-year period. Overall, 69% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States come from stationary sources, such as our electric utilities and petroleum refineries. This rider, which prevents the EPA from acting, will have far-reaching and devastating consequences on our nation's air quality. In particular, my Bronx Congressional District, which has one of the highest asthma rates in the nation, will continue to suffer from poor air quality. Because of the sharp reductions included in this bill to the programs and agencies that protect our environment, enrich our lives through the arts, and increase recreational opportunities, and because of the riders that harm our wildlife, our land, our water, and our air quality, I will be voting against this bill. And I yield back my time. The gentleman from New York yields back his time. The gentleman from Virginia reserves. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield two minutes, two minutes to a valued member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Calvert. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of the fiscal year 2012 Interior Environment and Related Agencies Appropriation Bill. I'd like to thank uh, our chairman, Chairman Simpson, and Ranking Member Moran uh, for being excellent leaders on the subcommittee. It's certainly been a pleasure to work with both of them. I especially commend the 22 oversight hearings uh, that our subcommittee held this year. This is subcommittee uh, works hard. We've done our due diligence in putting this bill together. The FY12 Interior uh, Environment Appropriation Bill recognizes the current environment for the past four years is out of control spending. It's a $2.1 billion below last year's uh, level, as was mentioned, $3.8 billion below the President's uh, 12 request. It's a focused, lean bill that supports funding for duties that are clearly the responsibility of the federal government and makes tough decisions about how we allocate taxpayers' dollars. The bill fully funds federal firefighters, forest service, wildland, wild uh, uh, fire management, ensures our national parks that uh, belong to the American people remain fully operational in 2012. And finally, it includes $30 million for diesel reduction grants to retrofit old diesel engines with cleaner burning ones, a program that's been very successful and implemented across the United States and contributing to cleaner air. The bill also reduces EPA's inflated budget back down to the 06 level, cuts $46 million in requested funding for burdensome regulation of greenhouse gases, which means controlled carbon dioxide, regulation that unilaterally adopted by the administration uh, that is making U.S. Uh, less competitive in the world and sending American jobs overseas. Finally, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, there are many spending reductions in this bill, including pro programs I support. 
However, we, uh, we have to start somewhere to bring economic sanity uh, back to the budgeting process, and this is the first one of first of many steps to come. So in conclusion, I am pleased to support this bill. I urge all my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back. The gentleman from Idaho reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, may I request the, uh, how much time we have on either side in general debate? The gentleman from Virginia has ten and a half minutes. Ten and a half? Okay. And the gentleman from Idaho has six and a half minutes. Six and a half. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That I would yield uh, five minutes to the gentlelady from Minnesota, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Interior Environment Appropriations Subcommittee, I have great respect for Chairman Simpson, Ranking Member Moran, and the staffers on both sides of the aisle. One important aspect of this bill, Chairman Simpson and Representative Cole have worked together with Democrats to protect critical education and health care investments in Indian country as part of our trust relationship with the 565 tribes in this country. Native American children, families, and elders will all benefit as a result of our efforts. However, on virtually every other aspect of this bill, particularly on the environment, this appropriations bill is a radical attempt to take America backwards from 40 years of bipartisan progress of protecting human health and our environment. There are nearly 4D special interest policy writers in this bill. And it is outrageous that these writers protect corporate polluters while attacking clean water, clean air, our public lands, and wildlife conservation. Representatives Waxman, Markey, and Rush, as ranking members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and Natural Resources Committee, have sent letters expressing their grave concern about these extreme destructive policy writers that have no business being on an appropriations spending bill. This abuse of the legislative process to further Republicans' radical agenda on behalf of polluters and special interests should not be tolerated. These policy writers put public health of Americans at risk and will imperil America's natural heritage for future generations. In particular, Republicans have chosen to mount an unprecedented assault on the Environmental Protection Agency, an agency created by President Richard Nixon. Clearly, Republicans have now come full circle, and this bill makes House Republicans the most polluter-friendly Congress in nearly two generations. In addition to, cutting, and to cut, gutting, gutting the EPA's budget, Republicans have added 10 policy writers that will make the air we breathe dirtier and eight policy writers that will make the water we drink more polluted and toxic. The Republican writers halt the EPA's work under the Clean Air Act to protect the public health from the impacts of carbon dioxide pollution, mercury emissions, sulfur dioxide, soot, and smog. This will jeopardize the health of millions of children suffering from asthma and put more Americans at risk for strokes, heart disease, and other respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. In 2010, the EPA found the Clean Air Act saved 160,000 lives nationwide. That's equivalent to the entire population of Tempe, Arizona. By 2020, that number is expected to grow to 320,000 lives saved, leading to $2 trillion in economic benefits. The Republican writers also stopped the EPA's work under the Clean Water Act to clean our rivers, streams, lakes, and to protect our drinking water from the impacts of coal mining, stormwater discharge, and toxic nutrient pollution and pesticides. Essentially, House Republicans are telling the American people that protecting public health and the environment from corporate polluters is no longer important. And despite the Tea Party Republicans' supposed ban on earmarks, this bill is loaded with earmarks for a few privileged polluters and special interests. Here's just four out of the dozen Republican earmarks contained in this bill. An earmark for foreign companies to allow for uranium mining adjacent to the Grand Canyon, one of America's most treasured places. An earmark for Shell Oil to ignore environmental regulations to drill offshore in the Arctic Ocean. An earmark for a few sheep farmers subsidized by U.S. taxpayers on U.S. land so that they can evade environmental laws that protect bighorn sheep. And a special earmark for the state of Texas to continue its illegal air permitting program in violation of the Clean Air Act. These dirty, toxic, and dangerous earmarks to a few special interests come at the expense of cleaner water, 
healthier air, our cherished national parks, and endangered wildlife. Minnesotans are deeply, deeply troubled by this reckless bill that endangers the health of our communities while destroying our natural resources and our children's inheritance. This is one of the most extreme pieces of anti-environmental legislation to ever come to the floor of the House. As far as the American people are concerned, H.R. 2584 should be declared a toxic Superfund site, and that's so it, it, because it is so dangerous to human health and in the environment, it needs to be remediated rather than passed into law. And I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill and its abandonment of 40 years of progress we have made in protecting America's people's health and the American natural heritage. And with that, Mr. Speaker, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Minnesota yields back. The gentleman from Virginia reserves. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield two minutes to an esteemed uh, colleague and member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of this legislation. And I want to praise the process by which we arrived at this. This is probably the hardest working subcommittee on a very hard working appropriations committee. Twenty two separate hearings, uh, a very open process. I think even the minority that disagrees with some of the decisions were made would agree that they were made fairly, openly, transparently, and uh, by votes. And the American people can look at what we did. Usually when you come to this floor, you come to debate and to disagree, and we're certainly going to have a great deal of that over the course of the next several days as we work through the main legislation and, and the many amendments which undoubtedly will be offered. But I want to focus today on an area of bipartisan agreement, and that's the decisions that were made regarding funding in Indian country and Native American programs. Mr. Speaker, our chairman generously mentioned and appropriately mentioned the hard works that uh, Mr. Moran and Mr. Dix did in setting the foundation for the progress that's being built upon this year. What he was too modest about was his own role, first as a ranking member and then as the chairman, and also seeing that an appropriate focus was placed upon Indian country. And frankly, while I disagree with the administration in many places, I want to thank them as well, because in many cases they had great, uh, great suggestions. They certainly put forward serious proposals, and they've been very easy to work with in Native American issues. So there's a lot of praise here to go around. Most importantly, I think from an appropriation standpoint, the numbers speak for themselves. Bureau of Indian Affairs funding was cut, but actually cut less than the president requested. The Indian Health Service got a 9% increase, almost $400 million. And you can run through the program. IHS staffing for new facilities, $63 million, fully funded at the President's request. Road maintenance, $25 million, funded at the President's request. Indian Guaranteed Loan Program, something to help uh, tribes as they move into private industries, actually funded above the President's request. Contract support costs, fully funded, $228 million. Indian Health Service, fully funded, $574 million. The gentleman is recognized for an additional one minute. Thank you very much, and I thank the gentleman. Uh, contract support costs, again, fully funded or funded at very near what the, the President requests. And most importantly, language put in to make sure that those contracts are actually fully funded by the BIA, something that has not always happened in the past. Again, uh, important language on joint ventures, whereby we encourage tribes to take some of their revenue, work with the federal government, reinvest in health care facilities, other needed uh, infrastructure improvements in Indian country. I say all this just to point out that while we have serious disagreements and serious debates, and while we made very hard decisions, because overall funding in this bill is, as Chairman Simpson suggested, down 7 percent from last year and certainly well below the request that the President made, in this area, defending one of the most challenged populations in the country, Republicans and Democrats alike can be exceptionally proud of what was done and the priorities where we put again, the most challenged people that we deal with on that committee in the most favored position. That hasn't always happened. I want to thank my friend Chairman Simpson for making sure it happened, my friend Mr. Moran and Mr. Dix for doing the same. I yield back. The gentleman from Oklahoma yields back. The gentleman from Idaho reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, how much time on general debate? The gentleman from Virginia has five and a half minutes. 
Very good. Uh, and the gentleman from Idaho has three and a half minutes. Uh, we'll yield uh, two and a half minutes to the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from New York is recognized. I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I strongly oppose the FY 2012 Interior Appropriations Bill in its current form. Not only am I deeply troubled by the bill's lack of infrastructure investment that would create jobs, grow the economy, and protect public health, but it is unfortunate that the Appropriations Committee has included several dozen egregious special interest policy earmarks in the bill that will undermine our nation's commitment to clean water, clean air, and the environment, which are fundamental to local economies like the one I represent. We've heard from our friends on the Appropriations Committee that we must make difficult decisions in these trying economic times. I couldn't agree more. Furthermore, we've heard from the chairman of the subcommittee that he believes that many of the programs that are cut are good programs, but that we must be willing to make cuts to reduce our growing debt. Consider this. The bill cuts $2.1 billion uh, from 2011 levels for the Department of the Interior, EPA, and other agencies. However, if we were to eliminate the Bush tax cuts only for those households earning more than a million dollars per year, we could save the revenues necessary to preserve these critical agencies in less than 18 days. 18 days. The bill provides $1.4 billion less for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, a fund that is critical to both environmental protection and economic development. If we were to eliminate the Bush tax cuts, we could reestablish our commitment to clean water within 12 days, affecting only those tax cuts for million, people who make a million dollars a year or more. That's a reasonable price to pay for the economic development that would result. Over the past several months, we have heard repeatedly that we must do all that we can to prevent taxing our nation's job creators, a sentiment with which I agree in principle. However, let us be clear that in my district and in districts all across this country, it is the environment that is the job creator. The economy of my district depends on clean water, clean air, and safe, swimmable beaches. The cuts in this bill place all of these in jeopardy. If the Republican priorities in this bill prevail, we could put an effective tax rate of zero on the small businesses in my district, and it wouldn't help at all because they would have no income. And no income means no jobs. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from New York yields back. The gentleman from Virginia reserves, and the gentleman from Idaho is recognized. I thank the chairman. I yield two minutes to the esteemed former chairman of the full committee and uh, the uh, member emeritus uh, of several subcommittees, the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Lewis. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to express my deep appreciation to the chairman of the subcommittee as well as the ranking member especially for the number of public hearings they had re reviewing all of the programs of this subcommittee, uh, taking us back to regular order in almost unprecedented form, making sure the public had a chance to talk to us about their view as to how these programs were working. As we meet today, the country is faced with the crises regarding our debt. Should we raise the national debt ceiling or not? And that debate is swirling around whether we should reduce spending, or we should increase taxes to fund additional spending desired by the administration and the former majority. It's very, very important to know that we are at a crisis point in terms of spending. With that backdrop, backdrop we can hear the same de debate taking place in this very committee discussion. People complaining about a not enough money for EPA, for example. The fact is that most of these programs are overfunded relative to just a few years ago, and the debate and the concern is an expression about a desire for more spending or, or a lack of increased funding above and beyond the wish list of many around here. The fundamental issue ought to be discussed in terms of how programs have worked and not worked. I've heard many a complaint about air quality questions today by the other side. It was, Mr. Chairman, my privilege to write the toughest environmental laws in the country relative to improving air quality. And years ago, as we discussed implementing those policies in my state, California, the center of the discussion was to make sure we focus upon the real problems. We can solve the problems of stationary sources, we said then, very quickly, very easily, up to 97 percent plus of their pollution. The real problem lies with the automobile. Doing something serious about that and what people do driving in their cars is the key to the question. 
EPA has failed us in many, many a way dealing with these major challenges. And I would suggest that any number of issues that might be raised is illustrated by the one endangered species I'd mentioned. If I could have 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Gentleman is recognized for 30 seconds. That endangered species is the desert tortoise. We could have solved that problem years ago by planting endless numbers of eggs in the East Mojave. Instead, the EPA decided to ignore, and the environmentalists decided to ignore that potential, saying it took too long to plant those eggs and have them grow to adulthood. The fact is, over the last 15 years that we'd done that, we would not have that endangered species any longer. Recently, we're, we learned the only healthy population for the desert tortoise was on the the Army National Training Center Army base where they took care of the animals versus what we did in the environment. Indeed, the EPA deserves some serious review as well as reauthorization, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back his time. The gentleman from Idaho reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Oregon, uh, a uh, extraordinary champion of uh, the environment. The gentleman Mr. from Oregon is recognized for three minutes. I appreciate the gentleman's courtesy. Um, I'm uncomfortable coming to the floor having to speak against this bill. There's nobody in Congress that I have more respect and affection for than the subcommittee chairman. But this bill is an example of why the Republican budget gimmick last week is a fool's errand. If ever enacted, the public would be outraged. These critical programs uh, of EPA are not overfunded. Just talk to anybody in your home community dealing with things like the revolving fund for sewer and water. This bill is not balanced. There are opportunities where there could have been uh, fees and charges from people who profit from the activities of this bill, but no. Instead, we are shifting costs to the public and damage to the environment. We're actually giving more money to some of the special interests that profit from these activities. We are slashing things that matter to most Americans. The ability of the EPA to protect our families and their environment. Land acquisition to protect American treasures. It's going to cost hundreds of thousands of jobs in rural and small town America where people rely on our open spaces, our public lands, our park and recreational activities. It shortchanges America's future. You know, the, the jihad against climate change continues from my friends on the Republican side of the aisle. And it's ironic when people can barely walk outside in Washington, D.C., where we're dealing with drought, flood, wildfires, extreme weather events across the country, and the scientists tell us that it's related to human activity, and this budget reduces our ability to deal with climate change and extreme weather events. Well, uh, I agree that the subcommittee has a very difficult job, in part because of the unrealistic numbers that were given to them. But sadly, if you look at the bill in its entirety, I must take gentle exception to Chairman Rogers saying we all support the core mission of EPA. Sadly, anybody who reads this bill understands that that's not the case and it's being brought to us in a way that simply does undermines that core mission that means so much to Americans, to our environment, and our future. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Virginia reserves. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Reserve the gentleman the from Idaho has one minute. Reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Virginia. Well, Mr. Chairman, how much time do we have on general debate? The gentleman from uh, Virginia has 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, would the uh, gentleman uh, prefer to uh, speak? Then, uh, all right. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reality is that uh, this is a bad bill. Uh, there may be some uh, good people that have been involved in putting it together, 
I like the uh, distinguished chairman of the subcommittee, uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, this would um, uh, severely uh, restrict our government's ability to uh, improve the quality of our air and water. Uh, it would uh, 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 substantially cut programs that I think many of the American people take for granted. Uh, our vi environment will be despoiled by this bill if it becomes enacted. So I would strongly urge uh, that this body vote against it. And with that, we yield back whatever time we have. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized. I thank the chairman uh, and I thank the uh, members for the debate that has gone on this bill. I notice that uh, members on the other side of the aisle continue to refer to some of the policy provisions that are in this bill as policy writers special interest legislation. In fact, they were called earmark legislation in this bill, but they are special interest. Let me tell you, the only special interest that I care about right now are the unemployed people in this country looking for a job. And if you talk to any business in this country, the one thing they will tell you is the uncertainty created by the potential regulation and proposed regulation by the EPA is stopping them from expanding their businesses because they have no idea, no idea what it's going to cost to hire a new employee. They are the biggest wet blanket on our economy that we have today. So we need to do something about it. We need to rein them back in because they are totally out of control. And that's what this bill does. This is under an open rule. That means members will have the opportunity, if they have a different idea, if they can get a majority of the votes to remove some of these things, they can remove them. But I suspect more are going to be added rather than moved as this bill moves through its full consideration. I thank the chairman and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Idaho yields back his time. Both sides having yielded back, all time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The amendment printed in Section 2 of House Resolution 363 is adopted. During consideration of the bill for further amendment, the chair may accord priority in recognition to a member offering an amendment who has caused it to be printed in the designated place in the congressional record. Those amendments will be considered read. The clerk will read. Be it enacted that the following sums are appropriated for the Department of Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies for fiscal year 2012, namely, Title I, Department of the Interior, Bureau of Land Management, Management of Lands and Resources. What purpose does the gentleman rise? Mr. Chairman, I have a manager's amendment at the desk and ask unanimous consent that it be in order to consider the amendment in, on Blanc and at this point in the reading. Is there objection? Without objection. So ordered. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection. Mr. Chair, uh, the manager's amendment before us makes several technical and conforming changes to the bill. These are all non-controversial changes, and they have been shared with the minority. I believe the minority is supportive of this amendment, and I urge its adoption. We have no objection, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Both sides yield. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Idaho. Mr. Simpson, those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. What purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word for the purpose of entering into a colloquy with the distinguished chairman of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Moran for your leadership and for this opportunity uh, to discuss an important and urgent matter. As the Chairman knows, there are two acts that seek to conserve marine mammals, the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammals Protection Act. Uh, I am not here to debate the merits of those acts, but to discuss an inadvertent and unexpected consequence of them. Uh, there is what seems to be a contradiction when it comes to the protection of polar, polar bears. Exactly the opposite may be happening, be happening, and I yield to the gentleman from Idaho. I thank the gentleman for yielding, uh, and I thank the gentleman from Missouri. Uh, yes, I'm aware of this issue. This is one of those times when a law 
whose intent is to protect may be unintentionally causing harm, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman, you are correct. This is an urgent issue, as we know of, of polar bears, specific bears today that are in danger of being lost and which could be saved by importation into the United States. While it was the intent of Congress to protect these animals, the acts were never intended to be bureaucratic obstacles to common sense and to saving their lives. Some brief background is in order. Mr. Chairman, Section 101 of the Marine Mammals Protection Act established a moratorium on the importation of marine mammals. However, Section 102 and 104 of the Act allow for the issuance of permits for the importation of marine ma mammals under certain circumstances. Now, the Act generally prohibits permits for public display, display of marine mammals from a species or stock designated as depleted, which is defined as one that is listed as an endangered species or a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. On May 15, 2008, the Secretary of the Interior listed the polar bear as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act, and since then, no permits for the importation of polar bears for the health and welfare of the animal or for the purposes of public display have been issued by the Secretary. The Act does require that conservation plans for taking animals include proposals to enhance their habitat which in this case is impossible. One of the main reasons the polar bear was listed as threatened is the loss of their habitat. It is not possible to comply with this requirement, and we urge the Secretary to take this into consideration when making a final determination on these permits. There is also a requirement that such takings be for scientific purposes. Mr. Chairman, I think you would agree that establishing successful captive breeding programs for a threatened species fits into the Congress's intent for scientific purposes. Declining habitat conditions for the polar bear and increasing number of human-bear interactions have resulted in an increase in the number of polar bears brought into temporary or permanent captivity in Canada in recent years, including an increase in the number of non- releasable animals and orphan cubs. Canadian institutions cannot house all of these bears, and any animals not placed in suitable facilities could be euthanized or left to die in the wild. The government of Manitoba, Canada has passed legislation allowing such bears to be exported from Canada for purposes of captive maintenance and public display at accredited zoological institutions in the United States. These are institutions that have undergone a thorough and rigorous review and inspection process by zoological professionals who examine all aspects of an institution's operation. Prior to issuing those permits, the Secretary of the Interior should determine the institution is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and meets specific public display criteria as determined by the Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to clarify that, this, that, that it is your understanding that under these acts, the Secretary of the Interior may issue permits for the importation into the U.S. of live polar bears for the purpose of public display at appropriate accredited zoological institutions. Upon a finding that such importation will benefit the health and welfare of the animal, or is otherwise consistent with the conservation of the polar bear. In addition to other areas, the Secretary's authority is granted under the Marine Mammals Protection Act, Sections 102B and 104C4A. Again, I want to thank the Chairman for this opportunity. I yield to the gentleman from Idaho. The gentleman's time has expired. I move to strike. Oh, minutes. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Gentleman is recognized from Missouri.
Mr. Chairman, I, I yield to the chairman. I thank the I gentleman for yielding. Anything. I agree with the gentleman from Missouri, and I want to be clear, and I hope that the Secretary of Interior and the Fish and Wildlife Service hear us clearly when we say that it is the sense of the committee that under these acts, the Secretary of Interior may issue permits for the importation into the United States of live polar bears for the, po for the purposes of public display at appropriate accredited zoological institutions upon a finding that such importation will benefit the health and welfare of the animal or is otherwise consistent with the conservation of the polar bear. I thank the gentleman for raising this matter and for working with me on this important issue, and I yield back. The gentleman from Missouri. I, I, thank, I thank the chairman as well as uh, the ranking member, Mr. Dix, for yielding more time, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. Clerk will read. Page 2, line 9, Bureau of Land Management, Management of Lands and Resources, $918,227,000. In addition. What purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Moran of Virginia, page 2, line 20, insert after I the dollar the amount, the following. That it be considered as having been read. Without objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, as I noted previously, there are a lot of winners and losers in H.R. 2584. Two of the winners are the oil and gas companies and the cattle grazers who use our publicly owned land. One of the losers is the Indian Sanitation Facilities Program. My amendment would do two things. First, it decreases funding from the increase in the bill for the BLM's oil and gas and grazing management programs. Second, the amendment would restore the Indian Sanitation Facilities Program by what it was cut below the current spending level. I find it ironic that the majority refused to allow the administration to collect an inspection fee from the oil and gas industry, but had no problem in providing more taxpayer funds for the oil and gas industry. The oil and gas industry gets about $4 billion in subsidies per year. Likewise, cattle ranchers who pay the ridiculously low fee of $1.35 per month per cow, while states charge so much more. Texas, for example, charges $65 to $150 per cow per month to graze on state-owned lands. But the federal government charges only $1.35. Well, they would see an increase in taxpayer resources devoted to grazing management from 75 to $90 million, a 20% increase. If our national budget is truly about shared sacrifice, how about starting with the oil and gas companies that have profited so handsomely from the resources owned by the American public and from ranchers whose use of the public lands is heavily subsidized by the American taxpayer, and yet they get increases in the bill while Indian sanitation facilities are cut. That's why the second part of my amendment provides an additional $18.6 million for the Indian sanitation facilities program. It would simply restore funding to last year's level. At the end of FY 2010, there were about 230,000 Native American homes in need of sanitation facilities, including 34,000 homes without potable water. According to the Indian Health Service, Native Americans in these homes are at extremely high risk for gastrointestinal disease and respiratory disease at rates similar to third world countries. Additionally, the Indian Health Service has noted that many of these homes without services are very remote, have limited access to health care which increases the importance of improving environmental conditions in these homes. The least we can do is to provide the same level of funding that was provided this current year to the Indian Sanitation Facilities Program, which is an integral component of the Indian Health Service's disease prevention activities. I urge support of the amendment and reserve the balance of my time. Mr. Jim, may not reserve. Uh, the gentleman may not reserve his time. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, there, the, uh, the chairman suggested that uh, there were no special interests. Well, this disproves that. There are special interests. Oil and gas companies 
already getting subsidies from the American taxpayer of about $4 billion a year. They get increases in this bill. We're simply asking them to pay a little more towards the federal government's cost of managing, managing the fees that uh, they should be paying. Just a little bit more we're asking them to pay. And we're also asking the, the ranchers, who again get special interest subsidies in this bill, more money for the ranchers, more subsidy, more subsidy for the oil and gas companies, and yet at the same time, we cut the money that would uh, provide sanitation facilities for 230,000 Native American homes in, in need, and 34,000 of those homes are without even potable water. They are the losers, oil and gas companies, and the grazers are the winners in this bill. That's why I'd urge support for the amendment, Mr. Chairman.